Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast. If you're a first-time listener, we're excited to have you here. If you've been here for a while, we would love to hear your feedback. Make sure to leave a review, share this with a friend. This episode covers one of the most important topics when it comes to actually selling because this is how you control the levers in order to increase your close rate on demand and at will. If you ever wanted to do that, this episode is going to reveal how to do that. This is part one of part two of the eight factors that control closing percentages with Dan Kennedy and Bill Glazer. I don't think there's anybody that has had a bigger impact in the field of direct response than Dan Kennedy. The legend of Dan Kennedy should be ignored at your own peril. They're not really lessons, they're kind of laws that you live by. Dan opened my eyes to what small business marketing looks like. Dan teaches strategic direct response that is timeless. His ripple effect touches people who don't even know his name. The world as we know it was changed because Dan Kennedy became obsessed with marketing. Welcome to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with your host, Dan Kennedy. Well, hello, uh, Gold Plus members. This is Bill Glazer, and today I'm joined with Dan Kennedy, and uh, we have a really great call for you today. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this is one of those calls that unless you are uh, in your car driving around listening to this call, my recommendation is that you get paper and pen ready because I think there's going to be a lot of good notes that you're going to take today and and um, and really be help you all in your businesses. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is what's identified as the eight control factors that control Closing percentages. So, how do you better how do you better increase the closing percentages and all the sales you do? Uh, and before I, I ask Dan to get started, let me make a couple of comments about this. First of all, uh, it's important that you understand that these closing percentages control factors. These um, pertain both to face-to-face selling, so the kind of selling that I did the first 15 years in my career when I was on the selling floor of my menswear store where customers would come into the store uh, and I'd be selling them face-to-face, or else in mass media selling, so whether it's direct mail, email, websites, radio, TV, it doesn't matter, it's the same. Um, And um, in many ways... Well, there are, let me also comment that there are advantages to face to face selling and there are advantages to mass media selling. And I've, been, I've done them both, and, and I know Dan has done them both. Um, and um, one of the advantages to face to face selling is the fact that you can actually see body language, facial expressions when you are using these exact same con- con- uh, control factors. So you get sort of feedback from the person you are selling to. Whereas in mass media, obviously, the advantages are that it's not one-on-one and you can sort of go one-on-many. So uh, uh, the only thing that kind of has the advantage of both is when we do any kind of speaking from the platform. We're there, and it's not as good as one-on-one, but there you sort of can get both. So you can speak one-on-many. You can deliver the message one-on-many, and you can sort of get feedback from the audience. not as good as one-on-one, but it still kind of gives you some feedback. And uh, the other advantage of using this in mass media is the fact that you can actually craft the perfect presentation, whereas when you do one-on-one, usually everyone has got a little slight variation, a little slight difference, and sometimes when you're doing one-on-one selling, you, after you say something, you say to yourself, gee, that was stupid, I shouldn't have said that. So with the using these in mass media, you can deliver them the, the perfect presentation in, in mass media. So whether it's a sales letter or a video, online video, or anything like that, it's sort of the perfect presentation. So with that said, let's uh, – Dan, how are you? I'm doing good. Okay, good. And uh, I, I guess we won't we won't mention about your latest little mishap for everybody. What you and I were talking about. Uh, I'm alive. <laughs> okay, good. And um, let's move into our eight controlling factors. And the first one is the quality of the list selection of the prospects. And this sort of you know deals with Dan. What you call the uh, the who? So uh, do you want to get started talking about that? Well, I, I would say that in a sense it's obvious, but then getting people to do anything about it is not is not so easy. Um, for for reasons that you are familiar with, I was thinking not long ago about the instances in some 
29 years of speaking and selling from the platform when I have when I have bombed, when I have not done well. And there have only been three. And in every one of those cases, um, it was a mismatch uh, with an audience. Uh, very early, I, I had a fee-pay gig, and I spoke to a chapter of a thing called the Administrative Professional Society, um, which uh, the Administrative and Executive Professional Society, I think. I forget now even the acronym. But it's, it turns out it's basically a lot of middle management guys in engineering type companies. So they have pocket protectors and lead pencils and, uh, and the shoes with the laces and the little pinholes in them. And, um, uh, they love me and the meeting planner loved me and immediately wanted me to do the other 49 states, um, which even though at the time the fee from the 49 states would have been significant to me, I immediately turned it down having discovered from the first group that, you know, we were not a good fit in terms of them being good customers for me after the fact, let alone be selling to them while I was there. And I just think a lot of businesses um, start out and then stay in the mode of anybody, anybody with a pulse will pay attention to me is as good as anybody else to me, and I want to open the doors as wide as possible. And I'm afraid to narrow the doors, I including by narrowing the doors, I mean spending more money, not less money, to get a lead, to get an appointment, to get in front of somebody. Um, and so they waste a lot of time and energy uh, and money and capability uh, trying to sell whatever it is that they sell to people who are at very poor prospects, uh, a very poor fit. And... Uh, and if somebody will dig in and, and sort of fix that, everything else that they do automatically works better. Um, I, I was with a client a couple of weeks ago who's in the financial services industry and uh, puts investors in seminars in order to sell to them. And he'd been running a fairly extensive test over the past year of uh, big, broad newspaper ads and direct mail to everybody in an area in a particular zip codes of affluence um, versus targeting only people known to already own annuities. And the cost of putting the people in the room who already are known to own annuities is three times the cost of putting the others in the room, but the net profit per seminar uh, is double when you put the people who already own annuities in the room than when you put a big broad brush audience in the room. You have fewer of them. It costs you more to get them in the room, but the net profit per seminar is double. Uh, with 2020 hindsight, of course, it's the simple principle of a buyer is a buyer is a buyer, and a non-buyer is a non-buyer. Uh, but so you can take the exact same salesperson with exactly the same skills and same presentation and same <coughs> offer and same everything, and put them in front of two very differently sourced prospects or groups of prospects and get two very different outcomes. Yeah, and, um, and you know, and you're right. I mean, we, you know, I saw it exactly, you know, in the situation that you were talking about where two different days, two different groups of people, one of them was the right who, the, one, the other one was not the right who, and, an, an extraordinary result with the right who and a, and a dismal result with the on right who and, and it's right so and many people don't think about this they they really look at you know well, let me just throw my message out there and sort of like you know see why see what sticks and you can really it makes a huge difference with with sort of asking yourself in advance who that right who is uh, I'll tell you that um, in my own men's wear stores, which again I was doing mostly face to face selling there, uh, the uh, you know the, the who that that I or one of my sales associates got in front of made a dramatic difference in, in, in it. And, and actually, you know, now being out of men's wear business for two years and looking, you know, you always look back and you look at you what what if I only knew then what I know today what I would have done differently, I would have spent a lot more time on. Carefully attracting the, really the perfect who to that to that business. Um, I tell you something else, Dan, that you'll find interesting. 
um, I was recently looking over the uh, the members of my BGS marketing system, and I, I found an anomaly that I didn't realize existed till recently, which are women owners of retail stores are much better members of my BGS marketing system than men are, <laughs> and so uh, so that that has now given me a whole sort of different perspective on lead generation to to to, to look at lists that only have women's first names and in, in as far as the owners and spend more money and go after them more deeply. Well that that's right. It does it actually does several things for you. Um, that 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 kind of piece of information is extremely useful to people who will use it. Um, uh, number one, as you say, it affects list selection. Um, and so you now want to you know you you want to segment and you want to mail it's not only the women retailers, but you want to find as many of them as you possibly can to mail to, it affects how you spend money. So you might FedEx them and mail the men. You might use an eight-step sequence with them and only invest in a four-step sequence with the males. Um, And it suggests that you tweak your message all the way through, actually sending them different information in every one of the steps. Uh, female testimonials versus male testimonials, etc. And it, 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 that kind of information exists in just about every business because every business, every every sales situation has some sort of bias to it. And that may be a very different bias than what existed when you started BJS. We don't we don't know because I don't think you tracked it then. But you know, truth changes, reality changes. Um, and and so it needs to be watched all the time. Well, yeah, that piece of information is extremely valuable. Yeah, and I can assure you that bias has changed because when I, if you recall, when I first started BGS, I was only marketing to menswear retailers. And you know, to, to find a, a woman who owns a menswear store is very rare. But now that it, you know, actually uh, uh, bigger niches for us are furniture and ladies' wear than menswear, and there they're much more, you know, they're, you know much more plentiful. So, especially in ladies' wear, obviously, and so uh, yeah. So, uh, how in jewelry also? I, I should mention as jewelry, there's a lot of women entrepreneurs. I just did a uh, interview recently with with a gal named Cindy Ritzy, who has a uh, she's a peak performers member as well. She has a terrific uh, jewelry store in Daytona Beach and uh, does a great job with her marketing. And um, and yeah, I mean there are. There are a lot of them in other in other genres of retail. I, I guess well, there's, there's great false economy in not, you know, in not narrowing the focus to the best qualified prospects. And now that the cost of sale in most businesses is going up, and having valuable customers who are most willing to spend is even more important. Uh, this is an extremely important thing. Well, I, I just before we move to number two, so again, number one is the quality of the selection of the prospect. And before we move to number two, I just want to make two other comments about it, which sort of one of them ties this whole thing together, which is this, that the, that the result that you get at the end of your sales process is more important than than who you are in front of it at the beginning. So this who thing is all about who you get in front of at the beginning, which will, will will significantly increase the result at the end. And then the last thing I want to say about this is that uh, uh, at next year's Super Conference, which is a ways away, uh, the bonus day that we'll be doing on that Sunday at the end is exactly on this topic. It's, a, it's really is showing examples of how people have narrowly uh, and cleverly done good list sel- selection and segmentation in order to increase response. So this sort of like a little prelude into that extra day at the Super Conference next year. So number two on our list of eight control factors that you should write down, which is very, very closely linked to number one, I should point out, and in many ways it's confusing to people how closely linked it is, but, it's, but there is a significant separation from it, is how relevant and appropriate what you are selling is to the prospect you have chosen. So, Dan, I'm going to ask you to, to start off with explaining sort of the difference between well, what this is, number one, and how this is sort of different than, num- than, than, than number one. <laughs> well, number one sort of the precursor to it, right? I mean, right. The, 
the more we know about who it is that we are going to sell to. Um, I'm amused now when I talk to face-to-face salespeople, especially in business-to-business, who aren't bothering to even go Google their prospect before they go make a presentation to them. And so to do that, when I was doing face-to-face selling, you had to go to the library and you had to try and dig up something on your prospect. Now you can do it sitting in front of your computer and people still don't do it. But So whether it's one prospect or a group of prospects, as you say, one on many, uh, the more you know about who they are, now the better you can implement this second factor, which is making your your product, your service, your proof, your message uh, very, very relevant to that particular person and their interests and their belief systems. And, uh, and it's why big, broad-brush advertising, mainstream print, broadcast, etc., is actually so hard to make work because the vast majority of the eyeballs seeing it, it's not relevant to. And so there's massive waste in it. Um, every high-end magazine, upscale magazine I get, has many, many, many full-page ads for very expensive wristwatches in it. However, I don't like wearing wristwatches. I have no interest in a wristwatch. Uh, I'll probably never buy another wristwatch as long as I live. I already got two I don't wear. And so they're paying to reach me, but their message is completely irrelevant to me, and they have no way to even attempt to make it irrelevant to me, which is why targeted marketing and direct marketing is superior to mainstream. And so when you... But you can in niche publications. There's an example in, uh, there's a great example of this in, I think, the August newsletter, if I'm not mistaken, um, where I show an ad for a vitamin product designed to improve your eyesight. And the ad runs in NRA, National Rifle Association magazines. And the ad is totally all about hunters and marksmanship and being able to use a scope and shoot from a distance effectively. And the answer to all that is this bottle of pills. Now, if they ran a generic ad for the same bottle of pills, they would be woefully ineffective. But because they've matched the ad uh, to this particular reader and are in a media that gives them an opportunity to do so, uh, relevance will create response where, where ordinarily response would not occur at all. Um, and so your job really... If you want efficiency and if you want real leverage from your marketing dollars, your job is to stop throwing mud against the wall and create little mini businesses within your business that each have different marketing messages directed at different people so that you achieve relevance. And again, extending all the way to the end of that process now, when it is, when you are finally in in the place where a buying decision is going to occur, be that um, a face-to-face sale, a a telephone sale, filling out an order form, whatever, uh, the closing percentage is automatically going to go up because you've made whatever is being bought specifically for me, for the person buying it. And so you're selling selling what appears to be a custom product or service rather than an off-the-shelf product or service. You know, as you were saying that, I was thinking of two examples of that 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 sort of just recently occurred to me. One of them was I wrote a sales letter for actually for uh, for a client of mine, and he had three kind of very distinct uh, groups of people that this sales letter was distinct but but related groups of people that the sales letter was going to. But in each of the sales letters, I took the first third of the page and sort of. Uh, spoke directly. So I developed three different versions of it, but I did. And I, the first third of the page was kind of directed to the group of people that, that would be matched to who was going to be receiving this so that somebody would say that this is relevant to me. And then, and then the same exact thing yesterday. I was doing so, uh, an hour consult with, with a member, and uh, she was telling me. She also identified in her list some biases, and, and I told her exactly the same thing, is develop your sales letter for each different bias that you see in your list in order to um, speak directly to them, where, you know, as you say, Dan, the person, you know, the reaction that you want the person to get is that this is for me. Um, uh, I, I also, um, 
Well, I think that we can actually, can, I think we've sort of uh, nailed this one down. Let's move on to number three. And, and number three is, um, uh, uh, again, I very much learned this first from you, Dan, is this whole pre-sales positioning. So it's sort of how you pres- position yourself. And it's, I think we should start off by making sure that, that um, everybody understands that you do not want to sort of be positioned as a salesperson, but more as a person that, that's sort of like a, uh, uh, providing information to them, almost as a consultant to them, as an advisor, as a, somebody providing like diagnostic information to them. And what's really important about this is that this doesn't matter if and if you're selling a very specific type of unusual product or service or if you're selling something in the commodity business. And I get this a lot for people that walk up to me at one of our live events and they pretty much say, "Is you know, I'm in the commodity business, so I'm selling something everybody else is selling, so how do I sell it for prices higher than my competitors? Because you can just go online and you can... You can sell this. You can get this for less online if I raise my prices. And my my response always is is to move them into this position, which is they are no longer perceived to be just a seller of it, but more of an, uh, a trusted advisor slash uh, you know um, consultant to it. Now there are other things that we do as well, such as trying to move ourselves out of what looks like being a commodity business by bungling things in with it, et cetera. But this is sort of the first step to this, which is moving yourself out of that. And that's why we, you know, teach Dan, everybody should be really in the information marketing business because whether you're selling information or giving it away for free, it, it, it positions you as this person, this is the, as being sort of diagnostic, and it, it, this is this whole pre-sales type of thing. Um, so, and this can often be done many ways. I mean, you could provide reports, CDs, uh, you can manuals, um, DVDs, webinars, tele seminars. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. And I, I guess, Dan, what I'd like you to talk about is one of the things that you're really credited for as far as this whole pre-sales positioning, which you know you've done for many of your clients. Um, uh, for, I first saw, saw it with Craig Proctor when he did it for him, which is sort of the shock and all box. And you know, after that, I believe you've—I know you've done it for dentistry for for, um, for Miracle Year because I was involved with you on that, and dentistry for diabetic, diabetics, and Dr. Tom uh, Jack's uh, weight loss, and so that's the whole you know pre-positioning thing. So can you talk a little bit about that, and certainly anything else you want to mention about this? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, I get the same thing by the way of the well-begotten soul who. You know, my business is different, and the worst thing is that the difference is is I'm in a commodity business, and, you know, anybody and everybody can get what I sell, 500 different places, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the first thing they don't get is that in truth, just about everybody's in a commodity business. I mean, you know, if you decide to go get financial planning today, uh, open a newspaper and a phone book. I mean, everybody's in the financial planning business from the bank where you're going to make your deposit, you know, on up. So why does somebody get to charge fees and somebody else doesn't get to charge fees? And why does somebody get to have fee minimums and somebody else doesn't, you know? So really everybody's in that position until they effectively take themselves out of that position. And and so pre-sale positioning, you know, there's the issue of what the positioning ought to be and then there's the issue of what tools you use to create it. And the positioning, you know, the, the only thing you sort of left out, I mean, the positioning choices are uh, 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 doctor, diagnostic person, uh, uh, determining what somebody's needs are and then prescribing. Uh, expert, credible expert, authority figure, uh, trusted advisor, and celebrity. That's the only one you left out. And, and of course, the utopian position is some combination of all of those things. And in many instances, celebrity really has a lot more leverage to it than does credibility. Um, but uh, you want to put all that together in such a way that, the again, the closing effectiveness goes up because the person now does not question 
your prescription, your recommendations, uh, your expertise. Um, they are prone to do what you tell them to do. And they don't attempt to negotiate fees or price for fear that you won't accept them at all. Um, so part of that pre-sales positioning is, you know, they have to they have to be convinced in advance that they're going to be damn lucky if they're even able to get to do business with you um, so that they're not questioning you or attempting to negotiate the price. Uh, once you determine what that position is you want to achieve, then you start to look at all of the various and sundry tools, you know, that you might use uh, to achieve that in prospects' minds. And that may be authoring a book. It may be going and paying a much bigger name, credible expert or celebrity than you are to co-author a book with you. It may be lecturing. It may be all sorts of things. Uh, certainly, an important set of tools is what gets put into the hands of the prospect between the time that they step forward and raise their hands and identify themselves uh, as a prospect and the time that the actual sales presentation leading up to a close occurs. And in a walk-in environment, uh, uh, for example, uh, that may be the DVD that they have to go into the nice room um, with a cup of coffee and watch for 20 minutes before they get to a salesperson. Uh, in most environments, including the ones you mentioned, where leads are being generated and there is a some period of delay between them raising their hand and either a sales professional being face-to-face -face with them in their home or place of business or them being brought into a showroom, a store, an office of professional practice. Then what gets sent to them, what gets delivered to them, uh, can be engineered to do a lot of this heavy lifting, to create the positioning that that discourages questioning and doubt and negotiation and delay um, and encourages acceptance. One of those tools um, is what I've taken, as you said, to calling a shock and awe package, and it goes back many, many, many years. Um, the, the first time I ever saw um, a primitive but highly effective version of it, a contrarian version, uh, was in the speaking business, and at the time, pretty much everybody, uh, if they got an inquiry from a meeting planner, from a prospective client, they sent them a fancy full-color brochure, um, uh, maybe a page of testimonials, and an audio cassette or a video cassette, uh, a, a, a demo tape, if you will. And if they had a book, they put a book in it, in the package. And a guy by the name of Larry Dolan, who 80% of everybody that inquired booked him, um, what he was sending out was the cardboard box that you get 500 envelopes in from your printer or from the office supply store. Uh, so somebody would call and inquire about having Larry come speak and one of these boxes filled with filled with Xerox copies that holds about 500 pages. Xerox copies of Larry's testimonial letters with the first few on top picked to be relevant to that prospect. So if it was an association of manufacturers he made sure the first few testimonials were from other associations of manufacturers. If it was an association of salespeople, he made sure the first few were related to salespeople. The rest of the box was the same. And he would wrap it with ugly duct tape and stick a handwritten label on it and FedEx it to him. And uh, that was his shock and awe package. He, in all the years I knew him, he never had a demo tape, he never had a color brochure, he never had anything. Um, but the, his theory, which I think was correct, not that anybody sat and read all 500 of those letters. In fact, they probably only read the first few. But the, the fact that it was completely different than everything else everybody was sending them, and that in sheer bulk and weight um, being dropped on the desk, uh, it had impact. And the fact that it was sent FedEx had impact. Um, I, I've done these over the years. Um, one of the ones people have seen was for uh, Paul Johnson's Shed Shop selling backyard sheds. 
And so pretty much everybody, if they sent out anything, they sent out a price list um, and maybe a one-page with some photos of the different sheds on it. And, of course, our package included a videotape, now a DVD, made in infomercial style of happy shed owners in their natural habitats showing off their sheds and telling how they used them, uh, and at least one crying emotionally about the experience. Uh, a book of 102 stories uh, by shed shop owners of how they use their sheds. Um, uh, a whole packet of information, so much more than what anybody else was sending them and different in orientation than what anybody else was sending them. And therefore, he was able to sell at higher prices than anybody else, significantly. And, uh, and purely by switching this method, go from about a 30% first call close to an 80% first call close, and getting all the way to improving closing percentages. And in some businesses, they're much more elaborate than fancy. In other businesses, they're not. Uh, but the idea... Uh, is to gain attention, to make people pay attention to them because of their elaborateness, their bulk, uh, and their means of delivery, and then to structure their content to do all this pre-positioning so that by the time the prospect now takes the next step that is requested of them, be that inviting the sales professional into their home or office, going to the salesperson's, uh, office or showroom, the doctor's office, the clinic, um, coming on to a teleseminar or a webinar, coming to a telephone appointment with a salesperson, uh, whatever it is that they do next, uh, all that prepositioning has been done so that this person is as close to predetermined to buying as you can get them, is very unlikely to question uh, or challenge your uh, your status, your authority, your prescriptions, your recommendations, or your price. Now, in the speaking business, the opposite of Larry Dolan shocking all box was Anito Cabanes, who most of the people on the call will be familiar with Nito. And he went over the years from one brochure to a large, very fancy box, about the size maybe of like a novel game, but much deeper with die-cut innards that contain his hardcover books and his DVD and his testimonial letters and the impact of this thing versus the usual brochure arriving on a desk. I mean, it actually was so big it would be work to discard it. And you felt guilty doing anything but paying attention to it. So it got past the first object objective, which was gaining attention, uh, especially in clutter. And then its contents were engineered to do all this prepositioning so that your recommendations are accepted and not challenged. Um, in my own case, you know, I probably haven't, in 30 years, had 10 people try to negotiate fees. Um, and that's really not because I'm such a good closer. In fact, my argument often in professional selling situations is that if you have to close, uh, you've screwed up everything prior to the close they should really be closing you on why you should accept them. You shouldn't have to be closing them. Um, and, and, and I really have to do it. And it's not because I'm such a great salesperson. It's because I've done such a good job at the preposition. Yeah, um, you know, and what's, you know, what's interesting is as I'm listening to you is you think of the Dolan example and also the Nito Cabane example for speakers. You know, I get oftentimes speakers that, you know, they hear about our events and they send me information. And very few people if any, are, are using those approaches. There's everybody, most of them are still using the pretty fancy brochure approach. Matter of fact, you forwarded me one in the FedEx that you sent me recently with the exact same thing, using the real fancy, you know. Well, yeah, uh, he made two mistakes, actually. Two mistakes. Number two, he didn't make it relevant to us. Uh huh. He sent the like, same generic stuff he sends to everybody. Yeah, and, and yeah, it was very boilerplate. You know, I'm, I'm sure the letter that came with it is just a boilerplate letter that, come, that comes out with it. And, um, you know, the other thing I'll mention is, Neil Cobain, as far as the prepositioning, the other thing is that he did a great job with is, if you recall, he shows up speaking, handing over a DVD to play before he goes up on stage that, Talks that also further preposition him as being a, a real expert in his field, as opposed to what all the other speakers do, which is just go up on the stage and 
hope that they get a tr- tremendous introduction from the host. Um, let's move on to number four, which is the belief or disbelief that the prospect has about your assertions. And I think that um, um, that a couple of things about this is number one is this also speaks to the credibility issue. So, so credi- the, the credibility you've established can oftentimes uh, significantly uh, affect that their belief or the disbelief about you. And also, um, you know, this should also be often this should also be worked in throughout the entire content. The same as number three is about pre-sales positioning should be worked into the content. This should also be worked into the content. And so this is really kind of about, before I ask Dan to expand on this, this is really kind of about whether or not they trust you, your trustworthiness, or whether they believe what you're saying is truthful. And so, um, so Dan, you want to first comment about that, and then I'll give a couple of, of ways that, pe- the most common ways that I see people being able to apply this in their sales presentations. Yeah, I think, again, first of all, if anybody has an unsatisfactory closing percentage or finds closing sales difficult, um, it tells you that you haven't been believed along the way. And uh, and so the answer is not necessarily a harder close or a cleverer close or adding five bonuses to the close. Um, uh, the answer is to go back and take a look at where the points are all the way through from the very first time somebody raises their hand all the way through a presentation, where the points are that you're asking them to accept something as truth, to accept something as fact, and how well you're framing it and setting it up so that they will believe it. Um, the, in, the, in the encyclopedia business, um, I knew very well for a number of years uh, the vice president at World Book for their direct sales force when people used to go into the homes and sell encyclopedias face-to-face. And he went out of his way to recruit school teachers um, to be salespeople uh, because as soon as they identified themselves as a school teacher, they would be more likely to be believed about the assertions they made about the importance uh, of having an encyclopedia in the home. And so they actually weren't the best natural salespeople in the world, and it took more effort to turn them into decent salespeople, but they had this advantage. Um, and even when there's obvious reasons not to believe somebody, um, a lot of people will remember when Victor Kayyem bought Remington, and uh, he was one of the early CEO commercial spokespersons. Um, Iacocca did it with Chrysler, which a lot of people are familiar with that. But, you know, Victor's Remington commercial was, I like, I like the shaver so much I bought the company. Now, the truth, of course, is I own the company, so I have to like the shaver. Uh, I bought the company, I got to like it. And, obviously, I want you to buy it. But by framing it as, I like the shaver so much I bought the company, the disclosure, you know, the normal disclaimer of, well, you really can't believe what this guy says because, of course, he's going to tell me it's the best shaver in the world. He owns the thing. He's turned it into a reason to believe him. Um, I have language I use with celebrity endorsers that I got years ago from an insurance company uh, where you have to disclose that the person is compensated. Um, and I actually used the copy from Miracle here with Link Linkletter uh, where... Um, it says, the person essentially says, I'm so impressed with this product, this company, what a great job these people do, that I agreed to be their compensated endorser. And I want to tell you, and now you've turned the disclaimer into a reason to believe this person. Um, So I, I try and go all the way through the sales case being built and identify the the points where we are asking someone to accept now a new fact, a new truth, uh, and those are all building blocks that lead to the willingness now to buy the product or the service and make sure that to whatever extent is possible, we are making the, the person, uh, 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 making that assertion 
and the assertion itself connected in a believable way. Thank you for listening to the Magnetic Marketing Podcast with Dan Kennedy. If you love hearing in on these lost Dan Kennedy talks and speeches and calls, then please let someone else know about this podcast. That's how you can help it to grow. And the more it grows, the more free Dan Kennedy we can bring to you. Also, Dan would love to give you the most incredible free gift ever designed to help you make maximum money in minimum time. Now, this free gift comes with almost $20,000 in pure money-making information for free just for saying maybe. You can get this gift from Dan right now at nobsletter.com. Not only will you get the $20,000 gift, you're also going to get a subscription to two marketing newsletters that will be hand-delivered by the mailman to your mailbox each and every month, one from Dan Kennedy and one from me, Russell Brunson. To get this gift and your subscription, go to nobsletter.com right now.